Good evening, everybody. Amen. Uh, how y'all doing tonight? I see a few of you on here. Getting started just a few minutes after to give everybody a chance that might want to drop on in and share with us a little bit. Got a little bit of a different format. I'm messing around with a little bit more, trying to make it more visually effective for you and, and sharing this um, Bible study tonight. And I uh, hope everybody's feeling well and and um, slowly getting back to normal, hopefully, as we go forward. We're going to talk about Joseph a little bit tonight, the life of Joseph, and just uh, take about uh, 25 minutes or so and just uh, lay out some basic principles that... Um, we could apply to our lives from the life of Joseph and his example that he's given us and um, want to do that. Um, looks like uh, Rebecca Lynn's in here with us tonight. Good to see you. I hope your family's doing good. <laughs> Amen. Um, but uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the book of Genesis in just a moment here. Been enjoying this um, the weather, it's been a little a little bit hot today, but it's been pretty nice most of this week, and I've kind of enjoyed that. Uh, maybe it'll let the grass grow a little slower, um, and uh, so it won't be so quick to spread out and take over. Amen. Well, I'm going to share with you tonight, um, uh, like I said, from the life of Joseph. And let me ask first off, can you hear me okay? Just want to check and see if... Uh, you know, if my volume, how it's set, and if you're able to hear clearly what uh, I'm talking about tonight. Maybe you can just give me a nod online there and let me know uh, what it looks like or what it sounds like um, as we get into the Word of God tonight. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm going to go ahead and pray and, and uh, ask the Lord to be with us. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the Word you've given us. We thank you for the multitude of examples that you've laid before us in your word that we can look to, to lead and guide us as we walk this earthly place that you've put us upon. Let your word speak to our hearts, we pray tonight, and help it to guide us each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. I wanted to mention also, of course, um, this Sunday is Father's Day and slash Mother's Day. We're going to honor our mothers and fathers just a little bit since we weren't able to have Mother's Day. And we have our Sunday school classes, of course, uh, starting this Sunday as well at 10 o'clock and worship at 1045. And then next Wednesday evening, uh, we're planning on, as things go as planned, to go back to a Bible study format at church on Wednesday night. Uh, kind of playing that by ear, but the plans as of right now are to do that. Uh, it's possible we might wait one more week. We're just going to see how, how things are going here. But... But anyway, I just wanted to mention that before I get into the word of the Lord tonight. Amen. Well, I'm going to try to share the scriptures with you a little bit. Um, we're going to go to uh, we're going to go to Genesis 37, and I'm going to read a scripture for you, and you can see it there on the screen. At least I hope you can. I think. <laughs> Amen. Genesis 37 and verse 19. Uh, we're talking about the life of Joseph, and if there's anybody in the Bible that would be um, a great example that you could aspire, aspire to to be like, to live like, it's, it's Joseph, I believe. Um, his example in, um, in adversity, um, I mean, anything that could, could go wrong uh, went wrong for him, uh, basically, in his life. And uh, yet, through it all, uh, he was able to keep uh, his right spirit. Um, I'm sure he struggled. But he was able to be a great example for us how to live victoriously uh, in adversity and that we face in life. So let, let's look at this. Uh, Genesis 37 and 19 through 20. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say... Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. You look at Joseph's life, first of all, let me say tonight, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these points. I hope to get through them all. But uh, Joseph, first of all, he did nothing wrong. He had done nothing wrong. Um, 
he simply now you could make the argument he was uh, in his immaturity, uh, maybe came across boastful and you know flamboyant to his brothers, kind of you know. But I, I don't know that I don't know his heart. I wasn't there. Uh, but he did nothing wrong and was persecuted, and in fact he was hated by his own brothers uh, to the point that the Bible lets us know they sold him into slavery. Um, now, the Bible teaches us, and Joseph is our example we're looking at tonight and how it compares to us in our Christian walk. Um, the Bible teaches us that we will have problems on earth. And I think if we've lived any time at all, we know we're going to have problems. Uh, obviously, Joseph's situation was very extreme. But look what uh, John 16, uh, Jesus said. Um, and, I, and I'll read it on your text here tonight, I believe. Uh, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye may have peace. And then he goes on to say, in the world ye have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So he makes that point. He says, um, I'm telling you these things so that you can have peace in me. And then he let them know, yes, you're going to have problems on earth. But the reason I'm telling you all this stuff is so you can look to me for your peace because he reminded them, I have overcome, and so will you. And so uh, the Bible also lets us know that some of these trials that we're going to face, that we go through in life, uh, will be regular problems that are common uh, to, to everybody. Uh, Matthew 5 and 45 he says that ye may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust amen so he lets us know right there that there are problems that are common to everyone not every problem that we have is judgment from god um it just rains on the just and the unjust things do happen that's not to say that God can't protect us uh, from things. And I'm sure that when we are in his presence one day and we look back, the Bible says we'll see things clearly at that time. We don't see them clearly now. We don't understand it. As one old song says, we'll understand it better by and by. And we may look back and see, you know what, God's hand was in this situation or that situation. But there, there are things that just happen in life. You can't say if a person's living for God, they'll never have problems. That's not biblical. Uh, and you can't, and on the other hand, you can't say if somebody has problems doesn't mean that they're living right for God. That's not true either. So there are some problems that are just common uh, to our walk here on on this earthly plane. Um, other other problems are more specific to Christians, and uh, they are attacks from the enemy, and they are put there uh, to discourage us. That's the key thing. Sometimes we can put too much emphasis on the attacks from the enemy. Attack, attack, attack. This is happening. That's that. The enemy's doing this. Well, he's doing things. It's kind of like the, you know, the gnats that fly around you or the, the bees that try to sting you. Uh, they they can't destroy you, but they can try to discourage you and uh, get you to moving. You know, down south, the mosquitoes are pretty bad <laughs> when you go down there, and it don't take long. You kind of get off the porch. You know, at certain times of the evening. <laughs> Um, they can't they can't kill you, but they can sure try to move you. And that's what the enemy will try to do. He'll try to discourage you. Uh, let me look at the scripture in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 5 and 8. He instructs us, be sober. Uh, be serious, in other words, clear-minded. Uh, be watchful. Why? Well, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Amen. So he lets us know, hey, you need to be you need to be aware. Uh, you need to be serious about this thing because there is an adversary who's going around uh, trying to put fear in your heart, fear in your life, and discourage you from continuing the walk uh, that you have with the Lord. But the problems we find the hardest to understand the, the, and, and the hardest to, to cope with, I think, um, and in fact, they are problems that maybe are the hardest for us to overcome, um, have to do with those that we know in the faith, our own brothers and sisters in the Lord. Psalms 55 says this, or excuse me, well, I guess I got ahead of myself. I may not have got that one. All right, I didn't get it on the screen, so I'll just read it to you. How's that? The old-fashioned way. <laughs> 
Psalms 55 says, For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it, uh, David said. Neither was it he that hateth me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. David said, man, that he said, that's the hardest thing. If it had been an enemy, I could understand it. He said, but it was somebody close to my heart. And so that, that's the hardest thing sometimes. And the Bible calls that attack or that problem, if you will, tonight. It calls that an offense. And it's not talking about the football team on the other side of the field. Uh, the Greek word scandalon uh, means a stumbling block. And I, the scripture talks about that. Jesus talked about Apostle Paul mentioned a stumbling block, uh, putting it before people. But it's something that causes someone to fall. Um, something that causes disappointment. It's opposite of what we expected in a very strong way. Uh, Luke chapter 17 and 1, Jesus, and he said unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that occasions of stumbling should come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Amen. Someone said that uh, an offense is like uh, the bait in a trap. Uh, it's harmless unless we feed it. Or we feed on it, I should say, not feed it. Uh, but it's deadly when it's consumed. So it's harmless unless we feed on it, but then it's deadly if we consume it. Um, it's a fact that if you love someone, you're close to someone, um, whether you know, it could be a spouse, a relative, children, um, that that's the ones that can hurt the most. That's the ones that can cut the most. Jesus himself even felt that. He was betrayed by those who were very close to him. Judas was one of his disciples. There were others uh, that turned against him, his own, his own people in his own town. Um, Jesus said, he said it is impossible. Now think about that. He said it's impossible to live in this life and not have had the opportunity to be offended. It's going to happen. It's there. Um, but the question is, not will we be offended, but Will you encounter this trap? You know, yes, you will encounter the trap. Uh, but how will you respond to it? That, that's the big question, of course. Jesus said that that trap will be there. The bait will be there. Uh, but how will you respond to that trap? Uh, in fact, everybody's talking about the end time now, you know. And that, that's good and proper if it gets us to look into the Word of God. Um, but one of the signs of the end time is that the Bible says many will be offended. Let's look at that scripture. I think I got it. Matthew 24 and 10. And then shall many stumble and shall deliver up one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall lead many astray. And because iniquity or sin uh, shall be multiplied. The love of the many shall wax cold. But thank goodness that's not the end. But he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Amen. So that's a, a, a reflection or a look into, I guess you would say, a magnification of, of looking at the end time. And one of the things of the end time is that um, offenses will be multiplied. Now, Jesus, notice Jesus warns of the false prophets immediately after his prophecy of many being offended. Um, he called false prophets wolves in Matthew 7 and 15 because wolves prey on the wounded. They prey on the young. Um, they, don't, they don't mess with the strong and healthy ones. They, they try to separate, they try to call out um, the wounded are the young ones away so they can attack them. And false, false, false prophets tell people what they want to hear, uh, not what they need to hear. And uh, 
offended people are easy prey for that um, because they're looking for somebody to lift them up and encourage them. Uh, cities of the ancient time had walls around them as a, a protection that was a strong show of force or at least um, a defense, a wall. It kept unwelcome people out um, and uh, everybody who came in was, you know, had to go through the gate. And they were screened as best as they could. Um, if you owed taxes, you weren't allowed in until that was paid. Um, those that were not uh, well were kept out of the city if they were felt to be a hazard to the health of the city. Uh, let, let's look at that, that concept of, of, of the wall, the process of getting into the city. Uh, Proverbs 18 and 19, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And such contentions are like the bars of a castle. Um, we construct walls in our lives um, at times. Uh, when we are hurt or wounded, we construct walls to safeguard our heart, to uh, prevent any more uh, wounds to our heart and our life, and, and we construct walls. And so we, like they did with their real uh, walls, we become selective in who we allow in through our walls. Um, we filter out anyone we think, you know, they owe us something, you know, that we, we're holding something uh, to their charge. Uh, we, maybe, maybe it's unforgiveness, whatever. Uh, uh, we withhold access to uh, these people uh, until their debts are paid. Uh, the, at least the debt we feel that, that they owe us is paid. But eventually what happens is when you construct walls like that, and this is an important part of the lesson tonight, is when you construct walls of protection, uh, they eventually become a prison. And of course, he says, strong city and such contentions are like the bars of a castle. So the walls that we construct uh, because of offenses, the walls that we construct because of wounds, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if that happens and we continue to do that, it becomes a prison. And at that point, uh, we're not only cautious about who comes in, but you know we're so concerned of future uh, offenses or future hurts that we don't go outside of our fortress. Uh, we become a man or a woman uh, in an island to ourselves. Nobody's going to hurt me. Nobody's going to do this or that. And so before long, we are just closed off from everybody. And there again, that's the danger, and the enemy can use that uh, to, he didn't stop us, but we took the bait, and we stopped ourselves. Um, and this is something that Joseph has shown us, and we'll cover that maybe another week, next week, or whatever, but it's, we don't have to stay uh, a prisoner to our own walls. He could have built walls. He was thrown in a pit by his brothers, sold into slavery. You know all the story, the the, the false accusations and, the, and more prison time and so on and so forth. It would have been easy for him to put up walls. I mean, big, gigantic walls uh, that you know who would have nobody would have said he didn't have a right to do that. I mean, uh, what he went through. Who somebody would say who, who could blame him? Uh, but if he had done that. Uh, he would not have been able to fulfill what God wanted him to accomplish in his life. Now, so if if you leave that unchecked, that concept of building walls, uh, that offense that you have, it turns into bitterness. Um, Hebrews 12 and 15, looking carefully, Paul says, lest there be any man that falleth short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby the many be defiled. Um, it, you know, when you have a garden or flower bed, you know, um, if you take care of the roots and they, they're, they're fertilized, they're watered, um, and you give the proper attention to them, they increase in their their strength and the depth that they go down into the ground and how they grow up because of that. Um, 
but there are some roots that we need to get out. And uh, actually, if you, I don't have a green thumb at all, but so I know about uh, weeds and weeds. You don't have to nurse, you know, if you just leave them to their own and you don't get them out, uh, they grow, don't they? Um, I mean, they have no problem whatsoever uh, of growing. And uh, the longer you leave them there, the harder they are to pull out. Uh, I tried this year to go around a little early before it got warm. We had all that rain, it seems like a while back now. And I tried, I went around and started getting down to the root, getting crabgrass and stuff out of my flower beds. And it was a lot easier when they were smaller like that uh, to get them out uh, as of and now. You know, and I noticed a few of them that I missed I should have got, and now it's harder. So it's important that we get those roots of bitterness out of our life. And that's why it's important we come to an altar, a place of prayer in our life with Jesus Christ and have an open book before him and soul, and do like David. Say, Lord, create in me a clean heart, a right spirit. God, take out the weeds. Uh, remove all the clutter. I don't want any root of bitterness to get a hold of my life and just choke out the work of God. In fact, that uh, one of the parables Jesus gave us to the sower and the, the seed that was thrown out there. And uh, he talked about some of it took root and then the cares of life choked it out. It's another example of our roots being affected. But anyway, um, so imagine tonight, and I'm not going to be much longer, but imagine tonight um, how different Joseph's story would have been um, if he would have yielded to that sin of, of offense. Yes, he was done wrong. No question. Nobody could make an argument. You know, the, everything that happened to him was, was wrong. Uh, he was, he was uh, treated badly by his brothers, um, sold into a life of slavery, um, wrongfully accused, uh, thrown into prison. Uh, you know, again, you might as well say he was slavery back in the prison now. Um, and then just on and on it goes. You know, people forget about him while he's there after they promise to do, do things to help him out. And so each time, imagine what kind of story it would have been if Joseph would have yielded to that temptation to let the, the offenses overwhelm him and choke out what God had intended for him. It would have been a whole different story. He would have been a bitter, angry man. He would have never, I'm sure, in that state of mind, reached out to the butler and the baker and would have shared nothing about God. But through all of that, he still had a testimony in his heart he would say, hey, hold on a minute. But I know a God that can help you. Wow, what a testimony. That's amazing, isn't it? You think about that tonight. Um, you know, Joseph lost everything. Uh, but, you know, the world can take away things, but they can't take away your heart's response. And Joseph, in spite of losing everything, he still had a choice. He had a choice in how he responded to that situation. And that's why his his life story is so strong and powerful. Um, if Joseph had been offended and got overwhelmed with the offense, he would have become angry, so angry that, in fact, if he somehow was still elevated that position, he would have took out his anger on his brothers, perhaps. Might have killed them. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. But anger can do a terrible thing if you allow it to stay in your heart. Um, I don't have this scripture to put on the screen, but um, Genesis 50 and 20, Joseph's, uh, his perspective. He says, but as for you, talking to his brothers, ye thought evil against me. He said, I know what you guys were doing. You were bad dudes. You were thinking evil thoughts. But God meant it, meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. In other words, Joseph said, I've learned to let God settle it. I've learned to put it in the hands of God and let him settle the account. Let him take care of the judgment or whatever he deems is, is right, right and wise in his mind. And uh, during his trials, uh, Joseph, uh, he couldn't see when he was going through all that, he couldn't see what God was doing. I'm not saying that he was sitting back, you know, while he was thrown in the pit 
saying, oh, thank you, God. I know that, you know, everything's going to be wonderful. I'm not saying that. He couldn't see that. There's no way he could understand that. Uh, when he was wrongfully accused after he had been elevated in, the, in his uh, master's house and thrown into prison again, he didn't get back there and say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for prison. I mean, you know, let's be real. He's human. Uh, but uh, he stayed the course. He kept the right spirit. He kept his heart right. And his testimony, in spite of all of that, what a powerful thing for us. How many times do we just throw our testimony away just by the slightest uh, inconvenience or, or maybe an offense that we feel is so strong against us. But what a testimony that he said so true to what he knew in his heart uh, that his father had taught him about God. And somehow he was able to keep that, that heart right. Um, forgiveness. I'm going to wrap up my final thought here. Forgiveness. You can't talk about Joseph uh, without talking about forgiveness. I mean, right? You can't, right? I mean, he's a supreme example of, of forgiveness. Um, because forgiveness is the only cure for an offense. It's the only way to deal with an offense. Uh, Jesus taught us that, and he you know, gave us multiple scriptures of forgiving those who uh, hate you, those who, for, those who uh, spitefully persecute you, so on and so forth. Uh, he said to pray for them, to love them. Um, but uh, his forgiveness is an example to us of the cure for an offense. When we forgive, when we choose, instead of taking the bait of the offense that would lead us to bitterness, when we instead choose to say, okay, God, I forgive and I release that. I release it to you, God. In other words, I trust you that you're going to you're going to do what needs to be done. Um, and somehow a, a good may come out of the situation. If if the good is only the fact that you stay faithful to God and and follow the course, then that might be it. It might not be like Joseph, where something wonderful and majestically uh, powerful happens. But it will be for the good if we give it to God. And it also shows we have trust. It's like that you know song that used to sing you know, a while back, you know, Jesus take the wheel. Uh, we, 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 we still um, try to stay in control. And forgiveness is an act of saying, okay, God, I'm not saying that when you forgive, it's not saying the person is not wrong. It's simply saying, God, I'm, I'm giving it to you. It's not going to weight me down. It's not going to make a root of bitterness be in me. Because I know that if I'm faithful to you, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. And so that purpose is to walk in his footsteps. Um, so let me, let me get to this here tonight, and I'm going to wrap up here in just a moment. We often ass we assign blame sometimes. Uh, if it weren't for this, then I would do this. Or sometimes we'll say, well, God, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. <laughs> uh, if you'll take care of this person or this situation, then I'll do this. Um, but but, but in, in the case of offenses, many times we'll say, well, if it wasn't for that or if it wasn't for this, you know, if, then, 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 you know, I, I, I would have done this for God. Well, all we are doing um, is we're, we're, we're saying my disappointment or my feelings um, is their fault. And maybe what they did did cause that, obviously, cause offense. But you're putting a restriction on the grace of God to help you in your life. And his grace is sufficient for us. Amen. Apostle Paul learned that himself, and it's true for us today. But... Um, but listen to this tonight, and I want to emphasize this in, in closing up this lesson. There is, there is no individual uh, on earth, and uh, there is no devil. I want to say that again. No person, and there is no devil that can get you out of the will of God. There is no one, no force 
that has that power to do that. We're the only ones that can get ourselves out of the will of God. When we stand before him on judgment, uh, what excuse can he use? Well, this happened in my life. It wasn't fair. This happened, you know, whatever. No, his grace is sufficient. Lean on him. Look to him, the author and finisher of your faith. Let him help you run the race. And remember the scripture, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Endurance race. It's not a sprint. It's not the, it's the tortoise and the hare. It's not the rabbit. It's that constant daily getting up, being faithful to God, in spite of it sometimes, just putting one foot in front of another. I used to say one day at a time. Sometimes I felt like just one footstep at a time, you know, because mm -hmm. of life can be that way. But let me just say this. So only you and I, we're the only ones that can, that can stop the will of God in our life. And so the challenge I want to take from tonight, from this lesson uh, from Joseph, uh, the thing that I want to take is the fact that, that Joseph stayed the course. He didn't allow what happened in his life, uh, although it was terribly wrong, stop him uh, from fulfilling God's will for his life. And so I want to encourage you, whatever you're facing now, whatever you might face next week, remember this. His grace is sufficient. Amen. Uh, there is no pit deep enough that he can't pull you out of. Amen. There's no sin uh, bad enough that he can't forgive you. In fact, the scripture says if we ask him to forgive us, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. And so uh, tonight I hope that you can take what I've shared with you, this bread of life, I hope it's ministered to you. Thank you guys for, for joining us. I see some of you online tonight. Thank you. Uh, you know, we all, of course, these are always saved afterwards, and uh, we put it on YouTube too, so you can always share it with somebody and uh, or send them to our YouTube channel. Uh, we did mention, uh, you might have heard a little bit about it on Facebook. We, we do have an app we're going to be trying here. I'll mention more on it Sunday. Uh, I've had a few people try it out for a trial basis. It, it's not something to, that you would have to have. Um, We'll still continue to post on Facebook and all that, like we've always been doing. But it's just another tool that if some people want to connect in the church in a private uh, group setting, we it's a way that you would get notifications on your phone about events that are coming up, uh, uh, contacting people in a more precise and personal way. So it's just something we'll be introducing and, and talking a little bit about. And uh, we'll be sending out information probably more after this Sunday uh, to give you a link to where you can download the app to your phone or your tablet. And you would just use it like you would Facebook kind of, uh, but it would only be our group of people uh, that we have put together. And then anybody who would uh, start to come to our church, we could put them in there too and help them connect uh, to everything that's going on at the church. So anyway, you'll hear more about that. I appreciate you guys tonight. Uh, hope everyone's doing well. Thank you for uh, coming and, and sharing the bread of life with us tonight. I uh, look forward to being with you Sunday, and uh, we'll be celebrating, as we said at the beginning uh, tonight, uh, the mothers and fathers a little bit, since our mothers missed out on that particular celebration, and uh, just coming together and worshiping the Lord together. Don't forget, we have Sunday school this Sunday at 10 o'clock, and the worship service at 10, 1045. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this tonight. And uh, Lord bless you. And God willing, uh, we'll see you on Sunday. Lord bless.